In this concluding piece to the series of films on microclotting in long COVID, Dr. Asad Khan and I talked to Dr. Yaku Laubscher um, about treatment. We ask which medications he's using, just how safe those drugs are, how one can test their effectiveness, and what kind of recovery rates he's seeing. So let's dive in. Yaku, how many patients have you treated so far with long COVID and uh, what have your results been like? So it's uh, 373 now. Um, and the, of those, let me start with the bad news. I mean, there's, there's five patients I've not been able to fix at all, made no difference. And those are the patients that's been sick for a long time, 18 months, two years. Um, and for some of the reason, I think, you know, the endothelium has just been too damaged uh, completely. But we've identified sort of two groups, uh, short, long COVID and long, long COVID. So short, long COVID is sometimes less than six months. These patients uh, often need uh, treatment for four to eight weeks, and the chances of a full recovery is excellent. Uh, compared to long, long COVID, you're sick for more than six months, uh, you're going to need treatment probably at least four to six months. And there's uh, you know, a chance that some of the symptoms I can't fix, and it's, you, know, you have to think of it probably as a, I think it was your idea, and I think it was perfect, it's like a stroke getting to the doctor, but too late, you know, the damage has been done. Some of it you just can't fix despite all treatment. So I'm carrying on with this because patients are getting better. I mean, I've had patients with two years of being diseased, uh, you know, a pediatrician from Texas, two years sick, stopped working, two months on treatment, nothing happened. Then she turned, she's back at work, fully functional. So even the very long, long COVIDs, you know, you know, seem to be able to recover, uh, you know, uh, significantly. Your probably your next question is, you know, how many how many complications have you had? And uh, so the treatment is blood thinning. To fix it, you need to control clotting, and 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 we use, um, you know, both medication for the the platelet activation. Uh, in fact, we use dual antiplatelet therapy, clopidogrel, aspirin. And as well, uh, at DOAC, I use a lot of apixaban. I think any one of them would probably be okay. Um, and so it's triple therapy, like a patient having a stent and atrial fibrillation is going to be on triple therapy as well. So when the cardiologist uses it, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's a standard treatment. When I'm using it, people say I'm poisoning my patients. But so what, what we're trying to achieve is get, get your body's clotting physiology back to normal. We're not trying to thin it more than usual. The blood is so sticky. That's what you know. I think most people don't understand. The blood is so sticky. You need a hell of a lot of treatment to get it just back to normal. So, all right, it's, it's, it's triple therapy. So I've had two severe bleeds so far, one nosebleed uh, needing medical attention and one uh, internal bleeding we think high up GI tract, we, we haven't identified the source yet, a patient needing two units of blood transfusion and hospitalization. So out of 373, two major bleeds is less than 1%. The direct trials on, on AF, you know, all of them between 2.5 and 3.5% severe bleeding. You know, that's, that's, that's quite high. Um, so I... It, Bruising, sort of common bruising, you bump yourself. That's that's common. That's to be, uh, you know, uh, understandable and accept uh, acceptable. And and obviously, in the a young woman, um, quite a heavy period is you know menstruation is also an issue that we manage very successfully with uh, adding tranexamic acid. Um, uh, so it's not been that big a big an issue. But you need to think about it. So in terms of the treatment itself and how patients respond to it, are there certain symptoms that seem to improve more frequently? And is there sort of a timeline where you see certain changes happen early in the treatment course and then other changes that take longer? Could you just talk us through what you're generally seeing amongst these 373 patients? In general, you look, there's no quick fix. It takes time to fix the endothelium, but especially the shorter, you know, the less than six months patients, they, they at the end of the second to the end of the third week of treatment, they often uh, report worsening of current symptoms or even new symptoms starting. To me, that's a very good sign. It tells me those, you know, microclots are starting to break up and we've examined those stuff with proteomics. We, we know what's inside there. There's a lot of antigens 
inside those microclots. It's being released. Your body's immune system responds to that. So that that's causing the new symptoms. But it's it's short lived. It's days, maybe you know, uh, maybe a week or so. Um, and then usually that's the sign of the recovery starting. And it seems to me like the the fatigue uh, and and PEM and and you know that part is easier to fix compared to the brain the bad brain fog that seems to take longer um, and, and and sometimes you know even months another interesting thing is that any new infection any new systemic infl inflammatory response will cause a setback i think your endothelium is is vulnerable and you know it it just can't handle it it doesn't have to be covid it can be a, you know a unit tract infection it can be you know, whatever. So I think you stay vulnerable for some time, but if you're if the endothelium has recovered for long enough, I'm you know I'm quite, quite confident it will become resilient and manage infection inflammation like it used to. I mean, certainly my experience of triple therapy, um, which I was on for many months, was that it took a while. But I had been sick for very long, and I had been very very sick, um, and. It was the third week when I started getting the side effects of um, the breakdown of the clots, and it was unpleasant. Uh, but there is a way around it. Uh, I mean, you can dampen the symptoms with steroids and antihistamines, and that was effective. Yeah. Um, so I guess my next question is that um, I get a lot of um, pushback from other health professionals, uh, particularly cardiologists, ironically, saying, what is the need for three anticoagulants? Um, and uh, again, they talk about the danger, which you have put it into context, but could you please explain perhaps uh, why you use three drugs? Look, I think uh, maybe that experience comes from managing acute COVID. Uh, and, and, you know, we, you, you, it sounds silly, but you need a CRP and a TEG, a thromboelastogram to manage acute severe COVID. Um, so we could measure the hypercoagulable state of of the severe COVIDs, and it is with you know, there's many other groups that that has worked with tech uh, to identify patients who would probably have a worse outcome. Uh, I think it's a very very sensitive test there. So we could we could adjust treatment to get normal clotting physio or try and get normal clotting physiology, and it always ended up being dual antiplatelets, sometimes a third antiplatelet, you know, intravenous uh, infusion type drug. Um, plus, uh, you know, I, I used a lot of uh, uh, fundaparinox, but you could use uh, therapeutic heparin or therapeutic uh, clexan. Um, so both arms of the, the clotting uh, uh, cascade, you need to fix platelets and the enzymatic pathway. And, you know, on top of that, uh, fibrinolytic therapy. And despite that, everything that medicine has to, to anticoagulate a patient, patients still died of clotting. That's the mode of death for acute severe clotting. So it, it's clear that a single drug and all the single drug trials are in acute severe COVID was negative. Uh, and the conclusion there, well, unless you've got proven DVT or proven uh, you know, macro clotting, uh, you shouldn't be on, on, on these drugs. It's completely wrong. You need to use everything, almost everything available, and you can measure it, um, uh, you know, and, and make sure you're not over-treating your patient. But that's, I think that's where it comes from. And I predict that probably going forward the next 12 months, there's going to be a, a number of trials done on single drug therapy, and they will fail I can predict it now, and it's going to be the wrong conclusion to say there's no place for anticoagulation. So if a patient wants to try something like triple therapy or to try some anticoagulation, how can they go about proving that their blood is too clotty? Because a lot of standard blood tests are coming back saying normal. Um, what pathways are available? Is it about fluorescent microscopy or are there other tests too that can indicate that the blood clotting processes are not working correctly? I think there's a few tests that's, that's you know, a D-dimer is useless. And, and, and the reason for that D-dimer comes from breakdown of clot. These microthrombi are resistant to breakdown. They contain a hell of a lot of 
alpha-2 antiplasmin to start off with. And, and there's no plasmin. Plasmin comes from healthy endothelium, and your endothelium is diseased. So D-dimer won't work. It, it doesn't show up. But the few tests, I think, that, that in different ways maybe tells you the same thing. With other words, there's diseased endothelium is the microscopy that we're doing. It, it's not freely available, but I think uh, Douglas Kell and them are working, uh, working hard to get that validated and, and available. Um, the uh, endothelial functional test, the, the brachial artery flow-mediated dilatation, it's not expensive, or the endopat, that's another one. Um, if a patient could do it, VO2 max uh, would help, but it's often patients are just too, you know, they too finished and tired to, to do it. Um, and then VEGF, I think, is, a, is quite a reasonable marker. Um, we've, we've written a, an article on, on some of these markers. I'm not, you know, the, 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 the little trial did show it, but I don't think it's a solid marker that you can say yes or no patients got it or not. I think those ones I've mentioned is, is probably the backbone. You mentioned briefly TAG. Um, and uh, another test that I get asked about sometimes on creature is a platelet factor assay. Could you very briefly tell us what they measure? So if you think about the you sort of standard and, you know, test on clotting, you, INR, PTT, you know, type of thing, you, centri you, you, you centrifuge off the cells, including platelets, and then you do the test. Platelets are essential in clotting. Platelets are the has been the most ignored cell in this whole disease. So TEG uses whole blood to to determine functionally, you know, how, uh, you know the, the clotting cascade basically. So you get with a TEG, you get an idea the time it takes for blood to start clotting, how long that takes, and then there's a uh, you know, the graph tells you exactly the, the um, contribution of platelets, uh, of fibrinogen, and the ability of the body to then break down clot lysis. So you get a lot of information just by looking at a tag. And um, it's, it's, it's interesting that with the PFA, the platelet functional assays, it's the old bleeding time, basically. So uh, I've been using a lot of, uh, obviously, base, basically clopidogrel aspirin and initially just did the PFA after two, maybe three months if a patient is not responding the way I think they should respond. But now I'm doing it after 14 days to see if there's actually, if the drugs are doing what it's supposed to do. So the PFA 200 tells you uh, if aspirin and clopidogrel are blocking the uh, specific channels, the P2Y and a, a collagen uh, epinephrine channel that they're supposed to do. And obviously, well, it's sort of a bit of a shock. Limp seems like 20 to 30% of patients are resistant to the effect of uh, clopidogrel. Um, aspirin working very well, but clopidogrel is, is an issue. You know, that's quite a high resistance. So that doesn't help to put a patient for three months on, on treatment is not working. So unfortunately, the vast majority of people watching this suffering from long COVID are going to find it difficult to get a prescription for a Pixaban, clopidogrel, aspirin. But they can get aspirin from the chemists. What else might they be able to do? What would be sensible? And do you have an opinion on things like natokinase, which I think is also being tried by quite a few long haulers at the moment? You know, Assad has got some experience with that, and I think he, he, he felt it made a difference. Um, uh, and, and I can understand why it should. Uh, it's To me, it's like if you want anticoagulation, use a proper drug. I think the dose findings may be a bit of an issue. Um, but I, I think if you don't have anything else available, I would agree to use it. I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with it. Um, there's another drug and not freely available. I don't think it's available in the UK. A, a, a group from Tunisia did a very elegant study on endothelial function with the uh, endopet uh, uh, stuff. And they used a drug called sulodexide. Um, it works on the endothelial glycocalyx, um, almost like a heparin-like drug. I like that. And and I've been trying to get a hold of it. It's difficult, but um, there is proper dose finding. They've, you know, there's a little study to back it. So that's something I, I would, you know, definitely consider. Um, 
but I think more importantly is, is to get the studies done, to get you know the work done, even if it's small pilot studies, you know, get it done and 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 give patients access. It's a very difficult thing. It's a very difficult issue, especially in children. It's very difficult. Why is it that despite your experience, despite there being unequivocal evidence from post-mortem and also from lab studies that clotting is a key issue here, that there is so much opposition and uh, why people keep saying that there is no evidence for what you're doing. I mean, what is your response to that and how do you deal with that kind of criticism? Um, look, um, I, get a, I get a lot of resistance. I think that the, the issue is, is the concept of microclotting. It's not something that's been taught in, in, in medical school in the last hundred years. But OK, let's go back. When I started medical school in the 80s, if you used a beta blocker for heart failure, you would have been you know, expelled. Uh, now it's the first line treatment. Uh, H. pylori, you know, was founded in in the early '80s. So we 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 come across new things, and we have to be open. And if you if you are then so negative about it or, or don't agree, do a trial and prove me that I'm talking nonsense. You know, it's simple as that. Then I'll shut up. But it's I think the there, there is sort of. It's a concept that this this uh, this this uh, the microclotting doesn't exist, but everything points to the same thing. You know, you, you've got this uh, the, the functional testing, the uh, you know the microclotting, the the VEGF, the VO two max. The everything points to the same thing. A huge thank you to Dr. Laubscher for his time and insights. Of course, there are still some huge questions on this topic, not least around how long haulers can get tested and these kind of treatments prescribed. But things are moving, and I know that Professor Pretorius and her team have recently been training other medical teams around the world on how to do the microscopy required to identify those microclots, which will hopefully lead to more progress, and as we get more research, hopefully we'll get some wider acceptance from the medical community. In my next film, I'm going to be going in a slightly different direction and talking to Susie Bolt about her rest, repair and recover program, which has had glowing reports from the long haulers who've tried it. It's not the yoga you're thinking of. Look after yourselves. Until next time.